Hello, everybody. Hey, hey. Hello, Ernesto. How are you, Dave? Fantastic. Great to uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> great to be here in uh, another episode of Leverage in the Toilet Absolutely. Paper Pirates. It's very exciting. Every time that we do this show, I have no clue as to what's going to happen next. But what I do know is in about 50 minutes or so, it was meant to be originally 20 minutes, 50 minutes or so, we will be laughing our heads off and we won't really know why. But that's pretty much how we roll. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. So today's episode is going to be about strengthening your network and also about travel because I think both of them are very linked and uh, I think um, I feel blessed because I have a network around the world. I mean, I have, um, I know people in literally every single continent. And I have had the opportunity to do that because I understand and I value the power of networking. But right now we cannot travel and uh, we cannot even meet people. So, of course, networking has been also put to a halt. And I think it's absolutely critical that we know how to do it even if we are on confinement. So Dave is uh, going to also be sharing with us how to change that word of networking because uh, networking, I think it's a confusing uh, topic because of course, if you if you search for networking, I mean, all you find, <laughs> all you find is uh, connecting cables and connecting computers together. <laughs> Yeah, networks, networking is a really strange thing to look at because it's it's evolved over the years to meaning lots of different things. And I don't think it's really been evolved effectively to include what social media can do to networks um, in the, the consciousness of most people. So I'm going to put that up to date properly by transferring the term networking into tribes and explaining why tribes are a much more effective way to grow your network. And we'll be doing that amongst a ton of things. I'm really excited about today's show. So much content is unbelievable. And they will not get it anywhere else. If you don't, if you leave this show and do anything else, you're daft. I'm just saying, that's all. Yeah, just saying. You know, yesterday I had a, um, a Zoom call with all my classmates. I graduated uh, high school in 1986. That makes me an wow. old fart. Yes, I know. And uh, it was great. I mean, it was just uh, fantastic, the possibility of uh, talking to all of them. I suddenly realized that most of my uh, classmates had no idea how to actually deal with Zoom. And uh, it really made me laugh, which is something, of course, that we want to uh, talk about. So, But right now, we've been mentioning that uh, there was, I mean, we actually even called it that it was going to happen. We said, you know, before covid uh, lockdown is over. There's going to be already competition for Zoom. And guess what happened yesterday? Yesterday, I was uh, reading the tech news. And uh, then I suddenly saw that uh, Facebook has added a free group video chat featuring called uh, Messenger Rooms. And uh, I have not tried it, but I was reading uh, the comments on CNET, which is, uh, I think, a very reputable uh, source of uh, information, and they were saying that that's absolutely great. Have you had a chance to look at it, uh, Dave? No, I haven't. I mean, I've got Zoom. I, I signed up for a professional level of Zoom, um, first of all, uh, straight away, because to be honest with you, as a, as a, uh, as a public speaker, uh, I just do public speaking now on Zoom, which is very exciting. But it was always going to be a, back, a backlash to the technology Zoom is effective, but there's lots of challenges with Zoom, as, you, as we all know, uh, and you've stated many times on this show. So I'm very excited to see what comes out of it, because it was something that people just... Zoom meant a call, it meant basically getting onto a conference call. Um, but I think that the evolution of it is going to be very interesting to see which one comes out of the best. Uh, and it's nice to see if there's competition as well. Well, that's what happens. The thing is, it is a meeting uh, platform. And that's what many people really do not understand. I mean, it's not a webinar. It's not a, a, a platform that you're going to be using for doing uh, sessions. So that's why it's a little bit confusing. But also, not only Facebook, but also Google came up with their own version, which is called Google Meet. And uh, apparently, there's about 3 uh, million people each day actually signing up for Google Meet. And I have not seen Google Meet either. But uh, I am definitely interested in having a look. 
So yeah. that is uh, that is quite interesting. So I feel though, sorry, I was just going to say, I feel though that depending on who the competition is, Google when they brought out uh, Google Plus, Google Plus wasn't the best user friendly. Uh, of all the, the social media platforms and has never really been used by anybody. It was just to get people's details. So I, I'm very skeptical about Google's one because they haven't done a great job with previous attempts to get into the market other than just Google. And uh, you know what I wanted to show uh, to people because I, I have seen it once. Uh, our friend and also amazing correspondent Tony Waitley here from Houston send us uh, this video where we actually can see hackers hacking into a Zoom call. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. So let's just play it. This is exactly how it happens live. Have a look. So you start seeing there, I mean, suddenly the, the, the uh, computer starts there and then it starts getting, look at these weird, weird uh, cartoons. And actually, if, yeah. if, I, if I will put the noise, it's actually very scary because really scary noises. So let me see. And then you can see how they are also there. They have actually taken over the uh, the presentation. And this uh, this one is not a very nasty one, but I have seen some uh, other videos where I mean they could go from showing porn to showing their privates to doing all sorts of weird things. You were telling me yesterday that you actually had an experience like this yesterday, right? Yeah, I was I was doing a, um, a motivational session for about hundred people yesterday. And they're all across the Middle East and, and India. Uh, and in the middle of it, somebody just starts writing across the screen in green, green pen for initials. As I'd shared my screen, I was showing a PowerPoint. And so um, I commented on it. And I actually unshared the screen, which cleaned it. Start, shared the screen again, and it was clean. So you can do it. But here, here's what that picture reminds me. It's the first time I've seen that video. It reminds me of that, vo that Momo thing that was done years, uh, about a year ago to scare kids. And it was an animated kind of um, version of, you know, the, the Ring, that Japanese uh, movie where you got that girl with all the hair that's kind yeah. of scary. It mm -hmm. was created, where, and it basically says it's going to kidnap kids and do horrible stuff. That kind of looks the same kind of thing. And if Zoom can't find a way of dealing with this, it will end up losing its entire empire because this is a deal breaker. If people find that it becomes annoying um, to the point of completely unprofessional and they don't do what WhatsApp do, which is create a privacy between the entry point and the exit point where it's all encrypted and you can't get in there. And I don't understand technology at all, so I might be wrong with this. Then they're going to end up losing people because anything that comes on board without even all the features but is clean and secure will just take everybody. Yeah, indeed. So right now we're talking about networking and uh, one of the things that is incredibly important is to actually keep in touch with uh, everybody from your tribe. And in a moment, Dave is going to explain what your tribe is. Yeah. But let me share with you something. It was an idea that, um, I mean, I, I, it came from uh, our also correspondent and good friend, Raymond Aaron. He sent me suddenly a video. He was uh, totally unshaven, and uh, he sent it just through WhatsApp to my phone. And he was saying, well, hi, my friend. Uh, this is Raymond. Uh, right now we are in uh, week three or whatever it was, week three, week four of this lockdown. And uh, I haven't heard from you, and uh, all I wanted to know is how you are. I mean, I hope that you're doing fine. My family is doing fine. And uh, I just uh, wanted just to, to, to connect with you and to let you know that you have a friend in Toronto. Very short, very sweet, 35 seconds. And then that exact video gave me a very soft feeling. I said, wow, this is such a powerful thing. So what I did is I created my own version. I am a little bit more... Uh, I mean, I, I made it a little bit more sophisticated. I made it look like if it was a postcard. But uh, this is something that I asked uh, Dave and I told Dave, well, you know, this is a great idea if you actually do it. But I will encourage absolutely everybody to go and do the same thing. So let me just show you the video. Then we can talk about it. And then we can get actually with the importance of having a network and having a tribe and uh, there's, of course, a point to discuss a little bit about uh, tribe, uh, being, being in a tribe and being the tribe leader, etc., etc. So, have a look. Hi, guys. Uh, here we are, all Vincent and uh, 
Joan and Nina and little Boris. And uh, we have been now for 40 something days in quarantine. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been quite tough. I mean, it's been a very different experience. And uh, the reason why we're doing this video is because we wanted to reconnect with you. We haven't uh, been in touch and we are basically checking on you to see how you guys are doing. Uh, and uh, of course to let you know that we are there for you, we're missing you and we would like to see you as uh, soon as possible or at least to reconnect digitally and this is the reason why we're doing this video. So guys, let's just uh, <laughs> reconnect with everybody. Take care. Take care. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you soon. I hope that you're all fine. Bye bye. That's beautiful. Uh, I think the term digital greetings card is probably a video greetings card is probably the best way to summarize that. But can I ask you a question? Did you forget the names of your family members? You had to look at them and go, we've got Nina, um, my wife, <laughs> my son, and the dog. It looked like you were trying to work it out at the beginning of the video. <laughs> so I recommend you to create one of these cards and send it to uh, your friends, somebody that you have not connected. And uh, one of the things that uh, I think it was you, Dave, that you were telling me, well, you know, if people are not connecting with you right now when are they going to connect <laughs> yeah absolutely and there's another thing that we talked about at length and it was quite a few shows ago i mean every show seems like quite a few shows ago but you should use um do on zoom if you want to do it contact your family your friends your close people and do an interview with them and record it and hold on to it because hopefully it's something that you've just got to share with the kids and the grandkids in one day but you never know when it might be the last opportunity to share who they were and what's going on. Sounds morbid, but I know that it's a very important fact that you can only reach people like this. So do interviews with people, keep that stuff in a hard drive or keep it in the cloud uh, just because you can. But now's the opportunity yeah. to do it. So that's uh, just a thought. Yeah, we're getting some very nice comments right now from uh, all the people watching the show. Uh, Ty Cohen, which is telling us great info. Ty, yesterday we had your piece on the show, and it was fantastic. I mean, I yeah. love your sense of humor. <laughs> Lots of the wife. We're assuming it was it was put on, but it might well be like my house, where that is every single minute of every single. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, we have here Brenda saying love the family video. Thank you. We have here uh, Jean Willem Gudrian all the way all the way from the Netherlands. Thank you, Jean Willem. Great to connect with you. Uh, we have here. Um, who else? We have here Frank Frank Mulcahy, which is one of our really loyal watchers. He's also saying hello. So fantastic. So Dave uh, tribes. First of all, I have an issue with the word tribe. Right. And that is because everybody's talking, well, it's my tribe, it's my tribe. And then suddenly some people need to be leader of the tribe. Yeah. And uh, to a certain extent, I think that is a limiting view. I know that you have been working on the word tribes and working on tribes and everything. So I think it will be fantastic if you can share all this great knowledge that you have on uh, tribes. We have a video that you have selected for us. Do you want to play the video first or do you yeah, want let, to let, let me do an introduction to the tribe first, to the concept, and then we show the video to explain it. And then I'll tell people how to work on putting that tribe together. Okay, so um, when we look at tribes, let's take it back a few steps because today's session is all about networking. Now, a network is a traditional way of getting people of a like mind or a like interest or want to do business with you into the same kind of community. Now, effectively, that would be a group. So, for instance, if you're active on LinkedIn or Facebook, you'll see the LinkedIn groups, the Facebook groups. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the people have the same emotional depth or interest. It just means it usually got the same kind of job title or why people stay together. Now, let me take that and change it. We're going to introduce tribes as a concept in a moment, but just hold on to that thought. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about the way that the Internet has developed is once upon a time, you would be famous for being very good at something. But we've seen through SEO and through noise and through all sorts of fake news and fake information that people can throw things out there that aren't true, but go higher up the rankings and then they become a truth to most people. So when you Google something and it doesn't come out as true, one of the few ways you can actually find the truth is to create a mastermind group around you or a tribe of people that will look after you, tell you what they think, and that way you can avoid fake stuff and move forward better. So with that in mind, Seth Godin created a book 
um, quite some time ago called Tribes and Why You Need Them. I think it was called something like that. You can Google it. It's brilliant. Seth Godin, an incredible voice uh, um, thought leader. And so let's have an introduction to that concept by watching this video all about tribes. Hey, so let's talk about Tribes, written by Seth Godin. Now, when I read this book, it was a pretty short book. There's like 150 pages in it, and it's a pretty small book. Seth Godin says that a tribe is a group of people connected to one another, or a leader, and connected to an idea. There only needs to be two things for a tribe to be present, a shared interest and a way to communicate. He says that tribes used to be local. He says that when communication was scarce, when the only way of communicating was talking, they used to be local, but now we have the internet. There can be tribes all over the world. There can be tribes from Microsoft to Facebook. There can be tribes to Red shoes with white shoestrings. Seriously, the niche area is huge and very specific. He said that you can lead a tribe. At the time of this upload, I have around 250 subscribers, and they are growing very quickly. Now, let's say I end up with around a thousand subscribers, and they're very faithful. They love all the content that I put out. So I have a thousand subscribers, and they're so faithful, they give me one dollar a day. Do you know how powerful this is? This is $365 over the course of a year. Times 1,000 people, that's basically a third of a million dollars. Now, you know people on YouTube who have millions Millions of subscribers and a dollar a day isn't that much but it's the scale that counts and Seth Godin basically wrote this book to try to convince you to come up with your own tribe and try to monetize it so you only need a couple hundred a couple thousand faithful followers faithful subscribers people who believe in your content if you're putting out awesome content once you get up to a hundred thousand subscribers or half a million subscribers then you make it huge but you only need around a thousand faithful subscribers in fact you only need one faithful subscriber that person will share the idea that you have with others and it will spread. It will spread like a virus. And that's basically what he's saying throughout this entire book. As he's trying to motivate you, he's saying ideas spread like crazy. They spread like viruses in today's world. They're very important. I think he wrote this book more as a way to try to inspire people. There's not very much practical knowledge in here. However, if you want to be inspired, I encourage you to read this book. I hope you enjoyed this little book review, and I hope it motivated you. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to join my tribe. So there we go, we've got our introduction to tribes there. I remember that you and I were on a, um, a, a digital marketer's cruise, internet marketer's cruise, Ernesto, about maybe 10 years or so ago. And we were sitting around the, the dining table of uh, a choice group of decision makers who were invited by a, a very well-known entrepreneur who said, I'm putting together a platform, a social media platform. Uh, what do you think should be the community idea behind it? I remember saying tribes, you should make it a tribe, and everyone looked at me like I'd gone bonkers because nobody had a clue what I was talking about. Um, but time has shown that tribe is a very strong concept. Do you remember? Am I, am I making this up? No, no, remember? no. I remember perfectly well. We were sitting there. It was uh, Brad Fallon and it was uh, uh, Mike Hill, and uh, there were a number of uh, who's who on the table. It I was. remember perfectly well. Is that who's who into the market? So, so here's why I think tribes are important. I know you said that you had a comment and a choice uh, to think about um, with um, leadership of a tribe. I think you have to have a leader, but the concept of a, of a leader is slightly different because when you're creating a tribe, it, it replaces groups. Now, let me explain exactly why that means something. If you were to create a group called Lawmakers in Dubai, say, because I live in Dubai, then you could have maybe 2,000, 3,000 people joining it. You could be a lawmaker if you're a traffic warden, you could be a judge, you could be a barrister, you could be a policeman, you could be a security guard. These are all people who are you know, keeping the law. And it doesn't mean they've got anything in common apart from the fact that their job is to keep the thing going. And some will be good people, some may be bad people, but they all get paid to do the law. If you had a different group called ethical lawmaking in Dubai, then maybe you'd have a lot fewer people joining the group. I'm not saying there's no ethical lawmakers in Dubai, but suppose you had 100 people. Now, the difference is if you had a group called lawmakers in Dubai, you'd have 3,000 people who all have a connection that their job pays them to be interested in the law. If you had ethical lawmaking, you'd have 100 people, but the roots of these people would go much deeper because the reason that they do their job is not because they get paid to uphold the law, but ethically, they want it to be something that helps the community. And so therefore, their investment is in it is much deeper. So that's the difference between a tribe and a group. Because it's easily done on LinkedIn, for instance, to join a, join a group. Because all you have to do is have the same kind of job title, same kind of background, same kind of industry. But when you start making it something that's emotionally deeper, then you create a tribe. 
So let's go through, first of all, what a tribe does. Then we'll go through the roles of individuals. Then you can work out whether you want to create a tribe or not. And I've actually got a tribe on LinkedIn, which is called the Global Speakers Group. Uh, and that's actually a tribe all about learning to be an, an effective speaker. We've got two and a half thousand people in that one because of the fact it's all about passion for speaking. So first of all, you've got to have a group of like-minded people and they've got to have a niche. Now, this niche has to be something that they're all really interested in. So if you don't have people from the same niche or the same community, they will find it boring. They won't be invested in it. And they're really not the people you want to keep in that. Now, you've also got to ask this group and you've got to think about it. What are they united for or what are they more united against? Sometimes people join because they're united against an enemy. So unethical lawmaking might be the reason that people come together. So you might find that what you want to do is create a, a, a tribe of people who want others to be able to sleep better and feel more comfortable during the coronavirus or deal with, with grief better if one of their loved ones has passed. So it's something that's very powerful. What are they against as opposed to necessarily what are they for? And then you've got to get to your group and say, well, what do your peers want? Not just your peers as in the people in the group, but the people in your industry because your tribe doesn't have to be exclusive. So supposing I was doing one for um, speakers. Now, in the speaking world, everybody's against everybody, kind of, because you're all trying to get the same kind of gigs. But that doesn't mean that we can't create a community of people sharing best practices. So who are the peers? And also, where are those peers? Now, typically with every single organization, and it's true if you look at the, the Discovery Channel on TV, on the satellite TV, you get the, the watering holes where all the animals go to drink. There is a watering hole for every industry. If I'm looking at speakers, where do they go to talk and share information? Is it Facebook? Is it LinkedIn? Do they actually have a community that they're already in of the my group? Where would I get them? So with your particular tribe, where do you meet them? Where are these people hanging out? So you go to that one place to announce that you've got a special tribe for them. So then what you do is you build and satisfy the community. Your job is not to own them. Your job is not to bully them. Your job is not to have an iron fist. And this is how you can get your rivals and your competitors to join the tribe by making it something bigger than you. So you may want to sponsor the tribe by your organization, but you don't want to make it so it's exclusively yours because then you'll never know what's going on. So what you do is you make it above you. You make it a bigger ethical reason for having this tribe. And invite all your competition and everybody in, even though they might be keeping a, a little bit of suspicion about why to join you in this, they'll learn very quickly that there's a bigger purpose. So then what you do is you drive the conversations. That's your job as the chief of a tribe. Now think about Arabic tribes, think about um, Indian tribes, um, Red Indian tribe, sorry, Native American tribes, and think about um, um, African tribes. Traditionally, there's a chiefdom, there's, a, there's a, um, a shaman who's in charge of a religious side of it, there's heretics who are up against it and don't buy into it, there's the braves, the warriors. I'll explain what their roles are. Your job as the chieftain is not to be the leader that bullies everybody, keeps them in line. That's done by your, your elders in the group. Your job is chief communications officer. Now, why is that so effective? Because then if you're driving the communication, get everyone to talk to each other, you're also aware of every conversation that happens in your industry, in your community. And that's where the power actually lies. Doesn't mean that you don't let other people into it, but it just means that you are very aware. That's why you create this platform and this relationship. So here's the thing about it. As you're creating it, you're the chief of a chief communication officer. The elders keep the traditions and they uphold all the ethics of your group. Your shaman is the one who comes up with the spiritual side of it. You know, the reason why we are together and the, the ways that we should do things that really work to keep us. Now, the mistake that many people do is they say, somebody's arguing with my tribe. They're creating a problem. They don't buy into everything I'm telling them. They're heretics. Now, heretics aren't necessarily against you. Heretics are just trying to work out whether this is the, the right tribe for them. Not everybody drinks the Kool-Aid. Some people want to question it to see if it's the right tribe for them. So what you need to do is listen to their questions and don't kick them out until you're sure that they need to be in their own tribe and the one that you've created is not the right one for them. Sometimes people question to know exactly why they should be there. 
there's a whole new area of conversation about being uh, engaged at work, which I won't get into. Um, but we'll talk about maybe tomorrow in a different time. So then you've got your braves and your warriors whose job is to go out and share with people what it is that you do and bring them into the fold and encourage people to be part of it. So why have a tribe at all? Well, because if you've got a network, it doesn't go deep enough. Now, a couple of things you want to look at when you're creating that network and creating that tribe and you're connecting with people, you want to have people have the same in common. So you've got common reasons ethically and emotionally why you want to stay together. You also want them to have a need and an interest in helping the group succeed. And that means all the people in the group succeed. You want to have them so they've got contacts that can help, even though they may start off originally as coming on their own. You want to have them willing to put time into it because some people might want to do it, but then they're just too busy. That's a waste of your time as well. They might be good for conversations or for reference, but they're not really a core member of your tribe. They have to have time to spare to invest. And they also have to have the want to help as well and connect you with the right people to grow the tribe and grow the community. So what is this apart from me just sharing an idea about a brand new network? If you can create a tribe in your company and a tribe in your industry, you'll have a much stronger network. So here's what happens when you drag your tribe and staff leave, they don't necessarily leave your tribe, they just don't stay working in your company. They can go work to a, another company and still stay within your tribe, share information, grow the relationship you have with people, and very likely bring people from a new company to join your tribe. It's a really effective community, it's a perfect network for having online, and with the amount of fake news and, and BS that flies around, it might well be the one that allows you to come up the other side of the coronavirus with a very effective business, an incredible network, and a direction that's going to take you in business for the foreseeable future. You know, when, when you were showing that video that says, well, you don't need that such a big tribe, but you need just a small tribe, which are loyal followers. Yesterday, when I was having this conversation with all my classmates, they were asking me, well, why are you doing this show if you're not getting paid for it? Uh, of course, I mean, you're investing time in putting it together. You're investing time in uh, doing the show and uh, you should not be getting paid for it. And I said, well, you're actually missing the point. What we are creating is we are basically letting people know that we have a certain way of thinking, that we have uh, a certain... Uh, um, different goals that we want to help the community. And uh, what happens is that you, when you put all together and you're attracting people to that tribe, then, of course, things start happening. And this is, I mean, you have been for a long time being a big advocate of the tribe. And uh, once again, as I, was, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the things that I have a difficulty with is when people say, well, you know, that's my tribe. Like if they will be... Uh, the Cherokee chief or something like that. And, and that is just something which is a wrong perspective of how to actually put it on. And then you just made it clear very nicely to say, well, you know, okay, you might be the the uh, guy that put it together. However, your job is just to, to make them be the followers, but you're going to be the chief communication officers. And what we are doing right now on this show is becoming the chief uh, communication officers from this tribe which we also decided to call the uh, Never Alone Tribe. We have not let you alone in 41 days. We are showing you that we're there for you. We are showing you that uh, we are uh, basically uh, well-spirited and we want to make sure that you are uh, well. This is exactly what we are doing because we're, we are going into an uncharted territory and, of course, we all need some uh, we all need some companionship and some uh, work. If you would like to join us, our group uh, in uh, in LinkedIn, we have created also another uh, group specifically for this. Go to bit.ly, never alone tribe. Let me just illustrate. Sorry, just before you move on, let me just add one point to what you're saying there. So hold on to that thought. One of the things that is a definition of power is somebody who's able to turn around to their group, to their community, and get things done without spending any money because they've created relationships of everybody in that group. And they will do it because they want to do it for you. Now, the most powerful person in any group is the person who's got relationships of everybody. Excellent, Dave. Well, I just uh, got transported to Dubai. So right now I am in Dubai. And hey! You're in <laughs> you know what? We never know that because we can't go out the house. It could well be, but we're, I'm in Houston right now. Yeehaw! That's correct. 
That is correct. So anyway, let's just uh, follow up with the news. I hope that you benefited from all this great information. Let's go up a little bit with the news because there are some interesting things. Right now, uh, I love this cartoon, which uh, it's just been shown all over the place in how uh, superheroes, which is right now we're living in a superhero, uh, superhero thought process and how they are uh thanking the uh the all these people which are actually dealing with all the disaster with that uh, coronavirus i absolutely love that i love it wonderful as a mad fan of superheroes and marvel and i have been most of my life uh it's absolutely right the real superheroes every single day are going into work because they believe in the greater good and they're putting themselves in danger because of exactly that thing and they're dropping like flies but that hasn't stopped them doing it uh and Every single country has got those leaders and those heroes, and they should be honored just the way that the superhero pictures have them bowing down to the, the more effective and the, the more ethically driven people amongst us. So that's a beautiful picture. Yeah, very nice. Uh, I want to show you this video from uh, Boris Johnson, uh, which, as I was saying, I mean, I'm once again taking policy, poli um, politics out. I have never really followed it, but I didn't really like him. But, you know, I mean, he's actually growing a soft spot, a soft spot in my heart because he's actually really becoming a leader of a tribe. And I love that. Look at how he's actually uh, communicating now to the country. This is, in my eyes, what a leader should be doing in the world. Have a look. And it is still true that this is the biggest single challenge this country has faced since the war. If this virus were a physical assailant, an unexpected and invisible mugger, which I can tell you from personal experience it is, then this is the moment when we have begun together to wrestle it to the floor. And so I know it is tough and I want to get this economy moving as fast as I can, but I refuse to throw away all the effort and the sacrifice of the British people and to risk a second major outbreak and huge loss of life and the overwhelming of the NHS. And I ask you to contain your impatience because I believe we are coming now to the end of the first phase of this conflict. And I can tell you now that preparations are underway and have been for weeks to allow us to win phase two of this fight, as I believe we are now on track to prevail in phase one. Very interesting. Now, we're not going to go near politics for obvious reasons, um, but here's one truth about any war that goes on. Typically, every single leader worldwide, when there's a war on, they get the grip, they, they pull the country together they pull all the competition together underneath the banner that as a, na as a nation, we will overcome. Now, this is everywhere, right around the world. Look at the ratings of almost every single leader, and it's a, it's a gift. That's why we'll see, and we, we won't go into the politics of it before, but there have been some very dubious wars in the last 10, 20 years that didn't need to happen. Why? Because what they do is they drive everybody who's trying to complain about politics to have to shut up and rally under the flag, the flag, because the nation's at war. Uh, Boris Johnson's doing there is, from his own experience, he's saying, oops, I really didn't play this properly, but I will do from now on. Now, whether he's done that for political reasons or he's done it because it's genuine, it doesn't really matter. The fact is it is working because he's caught the Wi-Fi code and the feeling of the entire country and actually the feel of the entire world. And that's why, politics aside you're resonating with him and you said and i think it's true he will become seen as one of the most popular british prime ministers of all time because he's got empathy now and because he's not about cutting the nhs the national health service in the uk he's about empowering them to get everybody together to keep everybody safe and that wasn't a message before he actually got struck down with the coronavirus your tribe won't rally behind you because everybody's thinking you've missed the point. Right now, everyone's vulnerable. Nobody wants to be in their home. Nobody wants to have to deal with this every single day, but we are for good reason. 
And when you get that and you tell people that you're working to make sure we come out of it with a, with a good um, result, then you're going to get everyone to join in. So I love that video. I think you're absolutely right, Ernesto. Yeah, I think uh, you really got it completely right. It is uh, getting the Wi-Fi code. I mean, uh, I remember my um, uh, father-in-law, he came here and he didn't have uh, his, uh, he, he didn't have data on his phone. So everywhere where he was going, his first question, I mean, if we, if we got into a restaurant, if you go, he wanted to get into the Wi-Fi code. And uh, that's what many leaders are actually missing. So if you want to connect with a group of people, if you want to grow your business, right now is the time to connect with their Wi-Fi code. And uh, I believe the toilet paper diaries has connected with the Wi-Fi code of a number of people. I mean, the audience has grown. We are getting a ton of people. Why? Because we are actually talking the same language. And that's what grows a tribe. So here's the question for you. I mean, if you want to grow your business, if you want to grow your tribe, what are you doing to connect into the Wi-Fi code uh, of the people that you would like to connect with? This is just absolutely critical. So make, uh, make sure that you get that on, into the back of your mind because that's going to make a big, big difference in how things are going to be for you after we come out of these uh, crazy times. Now, I mentioned that we were going to also talk about travel. And uh, I have an incredibly powerful video that I want to show you because uh, I love traveling. And uh, as uh, Dave was mentioning, I am one of the most traveled person <laughs> people in the world. What, what, what number is that? 257? Is that 247? 47, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, um, uh, I have the great opportunity to connect with so many people. I feel very comfortable everywhere in the world. And right now, for me, being here in isolation makes me very desperate because I, of course, have hands in my pants and I want to be traveling around. We're going to see a private pilot uh, going into the Mojave Desert to see where all the airlines here in the United States have their aircraft parked. This is a 15-minute video that I compressed into about four minutes, which is going to make you absolutely amazed. Have a look. Wow. This is insane. I don't even want to know how many billions of dollars of jets are down there. Clear. In today's crazy times, going out for a short flight every couple of weeks has been a good way to clear my head and stay proficient. And this flight was nothing short of epic. And Wabi Tower, Grumman 244, Echo Romeo, holding short, 1 2, uh, ready to go, New Hall. Grumman 4, Echo Romeo, inside of traffic, 2 miles, from Romeo 1 2, clear for takeoff, make a left down departure. Clear for takeoff, 1 2, left downwind, 4, Echo Romeo. Today's flight will take us to Victorville, California, out in the Mojave Desert. This is one of several locations throughout the United States where airliners are storing unused jets during the corona pandemic. Alright guys, so we're on our way to Victorville to check out the uh, planes that are grounded on the runway there. So a lot of the airplanes have been uh, storing their jets out at Victorville. It's a, it's a dry location, a remote location. But also Victorville has been a spot where Southwest has been uh, storing a lot of their 737 MAXs. Um, when they encountered all the problems last year. And uh, I'm gonna see if they'll let me do a low approach over that runway. Victorville, uh, it used to be an Air Force base. I think they closed it in the early 90s, 1992, I believe it was called George Air Force Base. Victorville normally has two runways. Because of the reduced demand from the pandemic, Runway 21 has been closed and turned into a parking lot for aircraft. Okay, so they granted a low approach 500 feet AGL over the uh, runway. This is going to be pretty interesting. Grumman 4, Echo Romeo, runway 21. Again, you are cleared for altitude restricted, low approach at or above 500 AGL. All right, here we go. Never done this before. This is truly a unique scene that underscores this unique moment in history.
Unbelievable. You know, it reminds me of it. Reminds me of when you see these on movies like Indiana Jones or whatever, where you've got the adventurers that find the elephant's graveyard, and there's just vast amounts of skeletons of elephants that go there to die. It's like a plains graveyard where they've just basically given up the ghost, and that's where they're keeping everything once it's dead. Um, I can't even imagine how much money uh, will have to go into waking up those aircrafts of those that will actually fly again. Because you said to me, planes are made to have to keep flying. The minute you leave them and ground them, it means that they're, they're just going to be obsolete, that you can't guarantee the safety because things rust and things need to keep moving. Well, so that's why, I, they are in the, that's why they are in the Mojave Desert. And uh, uh, right now, I think uh, the count is about 800 aircraft. So, I mean, I for me, that video, every time I see it, for... Uh, huge travelers i am and uh, being an airline person i mean it really makes me think exactly as he feels i mean i am also a private pilot and he says this is a historical time and i want you guys to think really we are living in historical times every single day that i wake up i definitely see how this is changing the world the world as we used to know it doesn't exist anymore we have to completely change our way of thinking. And here I want to give a shout out to our friend, uh, Joe Soto. He posted this recently and he said, always won't open new doors. And I think he's absolutely right. I mean, right now the world is completely different. We need to retool ourselves. We need to reskill ourselves and uh, we need to understand that uh, whatever we knew, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't exist it's not the same and it may never be the same again i mean it, it looking at that you'd have to you'd have to have an incredible movie that had the cgi budget to create a scene like that it's like a mad max movie where they find a city in the desert it's that incredible and it reminds me of i am legend where uh, will smith's walking through the, the the new york downtown and there's lions and creatures just roaming around absolutely incredible in fact we should be sharing some news all about what's going on around the world due to the coronavirus i think we should go into that um very soon because it's just fascinating when we're talking about a different world to see how different that world truly is yeah we have our uh, correspondent and uh, also travel expert uh and a super good friend and my other co-host in our other show uh pete garcia which uh, has pete. a uh has a a report on what's going on in the travel industry. Let's let's go to Pete because I think this is something that is incredibly important also for us to know. So Pete, are you there? Hello, Ernesto, Dave. Glad to be back from you. Uh, Pete Garcia here reporting from Houston, Texas with an update on the airline industry on a global basis. Uh, first, I wanted to report uh, some of the earnings uh, calls that have been made uh, for the first quarter 
uh, Delta reported a half a billion dollar loss, a little over half a billion dollar loss for the first quarter. Keep in mind that January and February were very good months uh, for travel in general. So when we look at the second quarter, it's going to be a much, much larger number. Uh, United Airlines just reported a $2 billion loss. Now, most of that or part of that is attributed not only to the coronavirus, but also to an investment that they made in a South American airline and uh, the fact that they've had to write that off because that airline is also not flying. Uh, why is this happening? Of course, everyone knows that we've got stay-at-home orders, but to quantify it, uh, traffic has do- dropped by a staggering 95%. With refunds being processed, there is more money going out the door than in the door from new ticket sales. Uh, JetBlue's uh, $20 million a day in refunds. Now, they're doing it via cra- travel credits when they can. Uh, refunds has been a major issue with airlines simply because they're trying to hold on to the cash that they have. But they are processing refunds and credit when the customer will accept a travel voucher for credit. What does this mean? Well, that means that today about a hundred million dollars are being lost by every, all of the U.S. major airlines. A hundred million dollars a day. Uh, so those numbers are going to grow in the future. International travel. Well, many countries have closed their borders. Uh, Italy is saying that looks like maybe not until next year. Uh, Canada, Mexico, borders are closed uh, throughout the world. We have borders that have been closed. People do not want to bring the, let the virus continue to grow in their country. So they are simply closing their borders. So as those restrictions are lifted, people will start uh, traveling again. But the forecast is not for several years. No one really knows how long this is going to last, but at least two, three years. Uh, you know, after the financial crisis, uh, the United States Airlines said it took up to seven years for traffic to come back to the same level. So this is going to be on a much, much larger scale. So while some people are saying two to three years, most airlines are saying they are going to come back in a very, very much reduced schedule. Smaller airlines are going to come out. Now, many airlines are trying to get bailout money. They're also uh, selling uh, stock. Uh, they're trying to find other ways to get loans. So they're not just depending on the government. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Australia, I just heard that uh, Virgin Australia is not going to get help. So it looks like they're going to go into what they call administration or bankruptcy. So we're going to see more of that. And I'll be bringing back more information to you soon. Reporting from Houston, back to you in the studio. Wow. Thank you, Uncle Pete. Fascinating, really scary. You know what? And I, I think one thing that is going to happen as well, Ernesto, I remember going back over the last t- two years, people were talking about having flying taxis, which are effectively drone technology that would pick you up, fly you above, take you off, drop you off, and so on. I wouldn't be surprised if that technology grows faster than the airline industry is able to deal with, because to get that whole world going again, is billions upon billions, even trillions of dollars to wake it up. I can easily see flying happening between now and then, just in a more personal basis, as drone technology with people working on that will be creating those taxis, which Dubai was actually pioneering, uh, and we're very close to becoming a thing. So I think that the airlines will find a different world to come back into um, than the one that they left behind where they dominated, and with good reason to dominate as well because every national airline was a big, a big money spinner for the government. Yeah, it is, uh, it is very interesting. Yesterday I was also reading an article about uh, the uh, Olympics in Japan and also uh, the Expo 2021 in Dubai. And uh, even though it is not confirmed, they are apparently, uh, they are uh, already considering that those two events, at least Japan is already very serious in actually making the announcement that the Olympics are going to be completely closed because of course they say, well, we're not going to do them. I mean, we have done everything to clean and now we're going to bring everybody to from all over the world to Japan to, 
<laughs> without having any control. And uh, apparently Dubai, Dubai was uh, basically mentioned as a side note, but I think that they are on that side. So right now, I think it's more than anything. I mean, these are clues. And once again, I am a trend, uh, trend hunter. And one of the things that I say to everybody is you need to understand that this is not the world that we were in. And uh, that's why we are getting into a complete new normal. But Dave, we are running out of time as usual. Oh my goodness, almost an hour. We're not gonna get that news in. I wanted that news bulletin to come in, that one we're talking about with all the stuff. Yeah, are we gonna I, save it till tomorrow? I think we're gonna have to save it till tomorrow because it's already, okay. uh, we're already running out of time. And I think possibly Facebook is gonna start charging us for uh, <laughs> being here. Remember, it's I always only a matter of time. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm using it like if it will be a, a uh, real um, uh, network, a broadcasting network. So I want to be as respectful as possible to all our watchers. It's been fantastic being with you, uh, Dave. And thank you to everybody that has been watching for free. And remember, we are living in absolutely historical times. Never, never seen anything like it. And you've got a new show coming up after this anyway, haven't you? Because you're, you're extra busy because it's bedtime for me in Dubai, whereas you're just starting your day. Um, is, it, is that the Magic Mike show, the one where you dance for the camera and people throw money at you? Or is it a different show you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly making a lot of money. Now you've got your other show coming up with Uncle Pete, haven't you, Pete Garcia? That is correct. You know, yesterday my uh, classmates were actually making fun of me because of my really big microphone. They were making all sorts of really horrible phallic comments about it, and uh, I was a bit embarrassed. <laughs> so it's well, good to know that you also have a big microphone there in front of you. <laughs> I'm a black guy. We all do. Anyway, uh, moving on. Oh my um, <laughs> on that bombshell, but no, no real God. surprise, it's TMI. a pleasure having TMI. you online. You right. started it. Bye bye. Can't, can't wait to see you tomorrow. Bye bye. You just call. You know wherever I am, I'll come running, 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 to see you again, to see you again. Oh, 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 oh,